Hello everyone, thank you for today's Palomino webinar. Uh, the topic is the unintended consequences of a too strict license policy. Uh, my name is Jeff Lush and I'll be leading today's webinar. Uh, I'm the founder of Palomino, I'm also our head of professional services. So I hope you'll enjoy today's session. Uh, we have the ability to ask questions uh, at the end and if you come up with a question during the talk, please type it into the uh, chat box on the right-hand side of the GoToWebinar client. And we'll look over this at the end and answer some questions. So today, today's topic is what happens when people first put in a license policy or component policy. Uh, what we're seeing uh, more and more is that companies are putting into place license and component policies which helps the developers understand what's expected, what's required, what's allowed, what's forbidden when it comes to using third-party components. And you'll hear a lot in the Palomino webinars that we talk about third-party components, not just open source. And by, by third-party components, what we mean is anything written outside of your organization, commercial, open source, things with no known licenses, whatever else it may be, basically something that came from outside. Uh, very often people create these policies with the idea that they're going to try to be as clear as possible and try to be as, as um, helpful to the developers as possible. But what happens is, is very often we're going to see the unintended consequence, typically involving where good components, components that you probably should be using or want to be using, are being dis uh, discarded and quote-unquote bad components being selected instead. We'll talk about some of the reasons why that may occur today. So the goal today is to walk through basically the five or six reasons why we see people having unintended consequences and come up with some best practices and some revised policies that may help uh, a cleaner license and component policy going forward. So the topics we'll go over today is why put policies in place. In some ways it's, it's pretty clear, but we'll walk through some of the data that we see out in the field. We have a, a series of common call them mistakes or just unintended consequences of setting a license policy. And then, and then we'll talk, I have some time for Q&A at the end. So the, the, the first slide here is, is really talking about what's the problem that we see. Well, companies are putting into place license policies and components policies because they're finding that they're using a lot more open source and a lot more third-party software than, than they thought they were. When Palomita goes out and we look at a typical code base, we always ask a, a customer what they think they have in it before we do our reviews or before they use our software. And afterward, we typically find anywhere from double to 100 times more than they expected, with, with a very common multiplier being 10, 20 times more than they, they knew. Um, and this has been true for as long as we've been looking, and it's not getting better. If anything, it's getting worse as people are using even more open source, uh, uh, as, as they're writing less code and they're gluing together more components, we're seeing basically the, the, the number of open source compliant components explode. Uh, people are seeing uh, licenses that they don't want to use or can't use. So maybe they can't use the general public license. Maybe they can't use the Afero license. Maybe there's commercial code sneaking into places that, that was unexpected, and so on and so on. And, and so what happens very often after these, this, this information is seen is a, a lawyer comes in, a VP of engineering comes in, somebody comes in and says, we need to set up a policy. And the policies come in, and, and very often the, the, uh, I, I, a lot of thought goes into them, but there are these consequences that, that do arise. We do want to talk about those things. So very common policies that come in are no licenses of a certain type. So no code under a GPL license no code under a, uh, a FARO license. And the developers hear this and, and they, they, they understand what that means and they go about their jobs. Well, let's talk about what happens after this. Well, the, the policies are put in place and, and, and they, they do restrict developer choice. And it's restricted on things such as license black blacklists. This may mean no GPL, no FARO. Uh, it may be a component blacklist that says, you know, for whatever reason, we're not going to use MongoDB or we're not going to use a certain cryptography library, or we're not going to use a certain, certain thing involving Linux or a certain commercial library. Um, there may be certain scary search terms where the, the legal team or the engineering team says, stay away from any component that talks about patents. 
stay away from anything that has the word encryption buried in deep inside the library. Or, or, or more simply, sometimes it's just folklore. Somebody involved with creating of the policy heard something from somebody about either a certain license or a certain component, and that just gets put into the license policy. We're not allowed to use certain components or certain licenses because Joe or Jane um, heard something bad about it, and we're just, that's just the way it's going to be. So these policies get set up, and things then happen. You, you do get a lot of engagement from your developers because they, they, they say, in some ways, finally, I know what I'm supposed to use, they know what I'm allowed to use and what I'm not allowed to use. There is sometimes some confusion and some education required about what is a license in the first place, how do I figure out what the license is. But once the developers get that, maybe you get a system put in place, like a, a request authorization workflow tool, maybe you build one yourself, you start to see some behaviors in the engineers. And you start to see some behaviors in the reviewers, the legal teams and the, the engineering teams, that we want to talk about. So the first one here is what I call great license but horrible library. And this is something that I'm seeing more and more. And when this occurs is when a company says, we are going to forbid a certain license type. So we're going to forbid the use of GPL in certain circumstances or across the board. No general public license allowed anywhere. No affero allowed anywhere. Um, and what happens here is we see developers getting pushed sometimes to lower quality libraries. The best of breed library may be under a GPL license or it may be under a dual license where it's a FARO or a commercial. But because of this license policy, your developers have been pushed from looking and choosing those to going someplace else on the internet and finding something that's just not as high quality, not as good, and sometimes has its own intellectual property problems. So when, when we look at these things, very often the, the good libraries, quote unquote good libraries, are supported by a large foundation. Maybe it's the Free Software Foundation. Maybe it's the Apache Foundation. Maybe it's some, some other organization that's out there that has a legal team, a security team, a budget, uh, organized code reviews, all those great things that you would expect out of a large foundation-supported component. But unfortunately, the, the components that they have are not under the license that you, you, you'll approve. So you see your developers basically go out and try to find something that's close enough or works alike, and they pick an alternative library that has a great license. MIT license, a BSD license, or whatever you've said is your, your most favorite license, but it's now being run by, say, a single developer with no user base. So nobody else is using this component in the entire world except you. Uh, there's no security reviews that have been done. There's no support uh, capacity. So if you called up this developer because it, it broke in the middle of the night, there's no way to pay for support. You might even not know the person's name. So let's, let's talk about a specific example. This is one I see in the field very often. MongoDB is, is, a, is a very hot and very popular NoSQL database that's out there right now that, that is, is under a dual license, a, a FARO or commercial license, does also have some uh, Apache uh, connectors. A lot of people happily use it, but I see some, some legal organizations, because they see the word a FARO, um, and they, they, they've heard perhaps folklore, perhaps for real, they say, well, we can't, we don't want to have anything to do with anything that says a FARO. We don't even be with an uh, five miles of anything that has the word a pharaoh anywhere near it. So we're going to forbid the use of Mongo. We're going to forbid the use of anything with a pharaoh. The developers hear this and they say, well, I really want to use Mongo. Mongo is hot. It's what everybody's do using for certain, for certain uh, uh, practices. I want to use it. Well, my, my legal team told me I can't use MongoDB. I, ca I can't use a pharaoh. So let's go out to the Internet and let's go find a clone, a workalike for Mongo. And I've seen this in the last couple months here where there's and two components that an organization tried to pick. One of the libraries was under an MIT license, so great license, very permissive, no viral issues, no patent issues, whatever. Legal team was extremely happy with the selection of this component. Well, when, when we got asked to look at the, the code quality and the IP of that library, because it was going to be such a big part of, uh, of, of this organization's uh, infrastructure, we looked at the two libraries that had been picked by different members of, of um, a development team for two different purposes, but it had the same reason. They couldn't use Mongo. They wanted to use Mongo. They went out and they found two clones, one for this group, one for this other group. The first clone of MongoDB, great license, but it was from a single developer. Nobody knew where. And they had a pseudonym instead of a real name. So we didn't know who the first name and last name of this person was. We didn't know what country they were based in. There was no information about uh, where this code came from, 
And when we did a review, we actually found code that was actually coming from MongoDB and being used in this alleged MIT licensed library. Well, that was a reason, basically, to not use this library at all. If you say, I can't use Mongo, and then you find somebody has just taken code from Mongo and it's just wrapped it, and you don't even know who the person is, well, that's a library that's not going to be allowed, even though allegedly it has a nice MIT license. Um, second case is a very similar issue where they looked, at the, they looked at the library, they asked us to take a look and do a code scan, and we found out that the, it was a clone written by a single developer, uh, no, no company, no budget, no, no code reviews, no security reviews. And for something that's going to be an important database component for your infrastructure, you want something that's secure, you want something that's fast, you want something that's supported. And the other thing that this was kind of almost an intangible is when we looked at the, the home page for this library, we saw that the author also sold what was called diet pills. So what, it, basically there was the software library here, here's my thing. Oh, by the way, I also sell diet pills. And this, this, this did not make the legal team happy that one of the major infrastructure pieces that they were going to use was coming from such a weird site. And they weren't quite sure if they could trust the code because it was only a single person. They don't think they could quite trust the person because there seemed to be too much going on in terms of was this, was this a real company? Was this a fake company? Why were they trying to do these somewhat weird things? So the revised policy that was come up here, and in general this is a best practice, is when you pick a library, licensing is important, but it's not the only thing. You should, you should discuss origin. You know, is it a single person or is it a thousand people? You should talk about what country it's from. You should talk about the, the quality of the product. Is there actual code reviews going on? Has somebody gone out and looked at it with a static analysis tool looking for bugs? Has somebody gone out and looked for export control issues and things like that? So that is when only after you've done those things should that library be allowed, especially if it is going to be such an important piece of your, your infrastructure, if it is going to be part of your operating system part of your database layer, part of your web server layer. You should really understand where it came from and what its security review policy is. A really important question to ask your developers is, is the desired library, when they make a request, is it being used instead of a library that they really want to use? So if you talk to the teams here and you say, why are you using these, these libraries that nobody's ever heard of? Well, they say, well, I wanted to use MongoDB, but I wasn't allowed. That's an important piece of information to have when you are doing your reviews. If you come across a library, you've never heard of it before, well, it's got a great license. Well, why are we using this? Oh, we're using this because we're not allowed to use MongoDB. This should, this should make you do that next level of analysis to say, well, people, people are picking an also rant, or they're picking a clone, or they're picking something from a sole proprietor that may not have the same review level as something from a venture-backed company that has hundreds of employees and a legal team and a security team. Uh, if something is coming as part of your architecture, so database, uh, web server, operating system, this may be a place to have your architecture team if you have one, or maybe senior engineers or an open source review board come together and talk about the usage of certain components not just our licensing, but to say, is this an appropriate component? Does it have the right quality? Does it have the right support structure? Does it have the right uh, kind of country of origin, person of origin, name that we can call up, pay for support? And if not, maybe we should keep looking. So this is, this is one of the most common things I'm seeing these days where companies are surprised where they say, we're, well, we're finally, quote unquote, clean from a, a licensing perspective. We're respecting all the licenses. We're not shipping copyleft code uh, unintentionally and so on and so on, but they're ending up sometimes with a lower quality product because they picked a higher quote unquote uh, quality license. So uh, uh, main, main feedback here is ask the team why they're using a certain component. And if you're here, it's because of I'm routing around the license policy or I'm trying to respect our license policy, definitely go deeper. The, the next mistake or the next consequence I see of people putting up their first policy is where they, they want to ask too many great questions. You know, they roll out a tool. Maybe they, they, they roll out something like Palomita. Maybe they, they build their own uh, SharePoint site or something like that. And finally, every lawyer and every technical manager, everybody from architecture and around gets to ask every single question they ever wanted to ask about the use of open source at request time. 
And so what should be a simple list of questions, you know, what is the component? Where did you get it? What purpose is it? And maybe a handful of other questions that, that help you because you're far away. Maybe you're five states away, five countries away. Help you understand what's going on and why it's being used. Sometimes balloons literally to ten pages of questions and question after question after question. And what we find is the more questions you ask, the fewer components get officially requested, but we all know they're getting still checked in. And, you know, people plead ignorance, or they say, oh, I forgot, or the form was too hard, and you just basically get routed around. So maybe it seems straightforward, but this is, this is one of the biggest struggles we have when we start working with companies when they first want to create their, their, their forms, is the form is huge, it has every question in the world, everything is required, and developers look at this and say, I can't, I can't do this, I'm not going to do this. So have your request form be as short as possible. And, and one of the things that's good is set a time limit. And just like we all just did our taxes recently here in the States. And you'll see at the bottom of a lot of the forms it says, we expect this form will take 20 minutes or two hours to fill in. Set a time limit. If you, if you think your developers really are not going to have patience for more than 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes of filling out a form and doing research, cut your form down until it fits in that, fits in that time limit. And, and, and one thing that people may do is they may grow the form after they encounter a problem or a question as opposed to doing it ahead of theoretical problems. We see so many of the questions that are being asked are one in a million questions you know, that, that are going to prevent something that is so theoretical that there's never been a concern about it, but the, the developer or the lawyer or the architecture person says, well, I want to know this just in case somebody does X, Y, Z. Uh, my experience is, Short forms, simple forms, set a time limit, 10, 15, 20 minutes for the amount of information that you need. And then if you encounter problems, look at your forms after the first month, after the first three months, after the six months. Grow your form, but a single question, two questions. Maybe get rid of old questions that haven't helped you make your choices as time goes on. And you'll get a lot more engagement. Uh, it, sometimes the irony is that when you roll out your brand new question, you actually get fewer component requests. And it's not because people are using fewer components, it's because they're routing around you. The, the, next, the next thing is very related, which is great questions, but that are just unanswerable. So again, very similar to the, the previous problem, is people start to ask questions at, for request forms that our policy is this, and you must fill in the following information. And the questions that come up are just ones that developers, a typical developer, doesn't have the knowledge to answer. Um, this very often comes up in the uh, encryption world uh, where there's questions regarding key length, re uh, regarding algorithms, uh, regarding basically uh, export control questions. And, and the typical developer has no clue about this. They don't even know that encryption may be a concern for your company. And when this required question comes up and it says, our policy is that we won't ship code with key lengths more than this or uh, these algorithms, et cetera, the developers have no way of figuring this out. They don't know where to go to, and, but they have a required field. And what happens is, is either they answer incorrectly. They say, oh, it doesn't have encryption, uh, even though it's OpenSSL and the whole thing is encryption. Or they give the answer that they think is desired. So if, if somebody says, our policy is that key lengths must be less than this, or the following algorithms are not to be used, well, guess what? The people who are filling in this form, rightly or wrongly, are going to pick the, 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 the answers that get their, their component request approved. So what we see that helps here is do some play testing. So get, get a typical core developer community together, not the people that help build the form, not the top 5 or 10% of your developers that you see coming to your brown bags on their own or coming to participating in the OSRB or speaking at conferences and things like that. You know, go out, you know, I always say you know, pizza, pizza gets a lot of answers. Go out and find your, 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 your middle 50% of your developers. Test your form. Just like in the previous uh, issue, can a typical developer make a request in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes? Here, can a typical developer answer your questions, especially your required questions? And if the answer is no, well, it probably should not be part of your forms. It may be, may be part of your policy. 
and you should try to make sure that your developers understand your policy around encryption or linking or all these things that are very difficult that, that developers think they know what's going on, um, but sometimes, again, come with their own folklore. You know, there's a lot of folklore about linking. There's a lot of folklore about modifications. And when you put your policy in place, developers sometimes are going to interpret your policy through that folklore. Or they're just not going to be able to answer. They, 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 they want to go home. They, they only have their 10 minutes they want to spend on this form, and they just click, 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 click. So do your play testing. Make sure that the typical developer can answer this form in 10, 15, 20 minutes. And, if, and the things where you want to enact policy, encryption is a place that everybody wants to and needs to uh, uh, enact a policy, this may be a case where things need an extra review by an architecture team or, or subject matter experts who come in and look at items for encryption, for example, or they look at it for patent issues, et cetera. Um, if you ask your developers, you know, are there any patent issues with this open source component, 90% of your developers don't even know that there's patents in place. They don't even know how they would answer that question. And you may not even want them doing that type of research. There's many companies who, who don't want their developers going out and looking at patents and, and, and patent forms and things like that. But if part of your policy is no patents are allowed in, these, in this open source, well, you've now made a case where your developers are going out and, and breaking the very policy that you want to put in place. So um, this is another place. It's great to ask these questions, but really make them as simple as possible. Test them with real developers, not just the ones that come to the brown bags, and, uh, and perhaps spin up a trained team of experts to help answer these policy questions and enact your policy around encryption, patents, and things like that. Another big issue I'm seeing today, which is the, 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 the unintended consequence of setting up a policy, is many policies get put into place and they talk about licenses, they talk about encryption, they talk about patents, export control, uh, subcomponent licenses, etc. And what happens is when you, when you go look at large open source libraries or libraries from uh, foundations like Apache or Free Software Foundation, Debian for example, places where there is a large user community places where there's been uh, enforcement of quality. You, know, you see this at Eclipse, where, where people have a, a process that they have to follow, things are disclosed, uh, there is a way of writing up subcomponents, licenses, uh, ECCN numbers, encryption, con uh, export control numbers, and things like that. And what happens very often is developers are told the policy, they said, we're, we're not, we don't want anything with encryption. We don't want anything with this or that. Or if you, if you, give, if you are going to use encryption, make sure you write it down. You know, we have the policy that says you know, we need to worry about export control. And what happens is developers start to go out and they want to pick an open source library to use. And they look at two or three or four choices. And one choice, uh, and the example here is Apache Commons Compress. The developer wants to use a compression library. And they see that their policy says, please stay away from components with export control issues. Please stay away from components with patents, et cetera. And they, they, they notice here that for the Apache Commons Compress project, that there is a legal notice that basically says, if you go to Apache and you go to the export control page, that library is put up there with an ECCN number, basically meaning that there's encryption technology present in this library. And the, the legal team looks at this and says, well, we, we don't want you to use this. We'll, we'll use the other library that doesn't seem to have uh, any notices around encryption, doesn't have any notices around ECCN. What happens is the developer then ends up using a, 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 kind of a, a work-alike library, a compression library, that has all the features that they wanted, well, buried deep inside of that library is the very same encryption algorithms that Apache had, but just it just didn't get exposed or disclosed to you, the user. So what happened here, and this happens all the time, is that um, high-quality components that have a lot of disclosures about what's going on inside of them are sometimes passed over for lower-quality components from smaller organizations or single sole proprietors who haven't done 
the effort that you're looking for. They haven't done code reviews. They haven't done export control reviews. They haven't done patent disclosures, while the same problems may live inside of those components. And it's very common that people end up uh, unintendedly ex uh, exporting encryption because they made this choice. They said, well, we don't want to use Apache because we see there's an ECCN number. Let's go use this one here from whatever library that we downloaded. So remember here, when you set up your policy and you review these things and you communicate this to your developers, a simple policy that says uh, stay away from export control issues should be revised. And remember that, that, as they always say, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because they don't talk about encryption, just because they don't talk about patents, doesn't mean that they're there. And there's certain types of libraries, encryption, uh, compression for one, networking for another, um, sometimes uh, things dealing with uh, uh, codecs. These, these may all involve compression. These may all involve encryption, encryption routines. And when you look at these, and if you see something comes across your desk that's, let's use this example, compression, and it doesn't talk about encryption, that, that itself may be a red flag. Or if something is known to be a, a, a encryption library, and the developers say, oh, there's, there's no export control number, or there's no information about, about um, encryption, you know, encryption technology here, but you just look at it and you know that it's OpenSSL or some other uh, encryption or security library, Basically, you should look at that and say, we need more information. Something, something's going on here. We're going to ask follow-up questions. It's also very helpful to let your developers know why you're concerned about, about these particular technologies, why, you know, that, that sometimes it's a sign of quality, not a sign of problems. So you shouldn't have your developers, based on your policy, shy away from using things that disclose encryption. If, if anything, you should look at those and say, this is a sign of higher quality component. It's telling us what's going on. Almost certainly, uh, anything else that is a clone or is a workalike is going to have to make the same architectural decisions about encryption or, or subcomponent licensing, et cetera, as the one we're looking at here. So um, it's not the end-all, be-all. You still may shy away after a review and say, well, we just, you know, we just, needed, encrypt we just needed compression without encryption. So we're going to go pick the library that gives us the, the features we're looking for. You know, maybe we'll go to Zlib instead of Apache Commons Compress, because all we simply need to do is use a compression routine. Maybe we'll use something that's built into the JDK, because um, we're already shipping that. So, so use these sometimes, use these questions, sometimes get more information about the architecture. Not just the what, but the why and the how. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to compress. Why? Well, for X, Y, Z reason. This is a great place to have your architecture team come in and say, well, we're already using the JDK, and the JDK gives us Zlib compression, quote, unquote, for free. Let's use that. Ah, okay, great. We don't have to use any more technology, and we don't have to worry about any more export control than what we're doing already. Another very common consequence of setting up your policy, especially for your first policy that you roll out, is that everybody wants to track everything. And your, your systems have been put in place over the last months or years, probably been designed to handle maybe 50 component requests, or maybe 100 or 500. There's some number that your, your legal team is able to handle, your engineering team is able to handle. And suddenly you roll out your new policy and you say everything, you know, track everything, track all the things. And your developers are sometimes not given uh, a, um, a guidance about the, what to start with first, and then next, and next. And so we've seen companies say, okay, we're going to ship a Linux appliance, and every file and every command line tool that's here needs to have an explicit uh, component request. We, want, we need to make sure that everything that goes out on our box fulfills our policy. And the problem with that is, is yes, you do need to respect the licensing. Yes, you need to make sure if you're shipping Linux and GPL code that you're doing everything you can to uh, respect those licenses and get, have the source available, show, give the, the GPL notices, et cetera. But if you find that, uh, especially in 2014, 
you're tracking everything like LS and CAT, every command line tool that ships on your appliance, or moral equivalent of that for other components, that is probably too deep. You need, to, you need to basically, in some ways, be a little pragmatic, figure out what is the most important issues here. Um, you should understand that you're using Linux. You should understand that you're using, uh, you're shipping it out the door. People need to understand that there is a GPL uh, license and effect on those. But what happens is the, the, the developer is going to push back on all policies. If, if it turns out that you're trying to track too much, if they look at it and they just say, I don't understand why I'm tracking the LS command when we have a thousand other open source libraries we're actually linking to, and we haven't even gotten to those yet, um, you're going to see yourself again getting routed around. So you have a great policy, you have a great workflow, but nobody's using it. Or they're using it for things that they, they know are going to get approved, and they, they route around things that are not going to get approved. So what, what sometimes happens here is you actually end up with less knowledge of components than before your policy was put in place. If you try to have everybody track too much. Or they start tracking things that are easy for them to, to write up, but not the hard things. So you see people just enumerating through uh, the command line tools. You see them enumerating through the RPMs um, that you're going to give away anyway. Maybe they're in the GPL license. It's just part of your Linux infrastructure. You already have your website up there that has all the source code or the disclosures. And what they've missed is all the commercial code. What they've missed is all the Java libraries that they've brought in as part of your, your user interface and so on and so on. So make sure that the team understands why you're asking for these things. Compliance is important. Uh, vulnerability tracking is important. Um, make sure that they understand what's the most important thing to you. For some organizations, it's Linux components first. Let's make sure our, our act is together around those and then get to our, our library components. Other companies say, we're going to start first with the things that we explicitly control, our applications, our libraries. That's the first place to make your requests. Um, so start slow, explain your reasons, and then gain support. Make it so that the culture is that you, you uh, everybody discloses what they're using, everybody uh, get the proper policy permission before they use it, and they're able to help change policy if something changes. You know, the, I've seen a lot of companies where they say, no GPL code allowed, and then they ship a Linux appliance. And the engineering team just doesn't understand what's going on there. And sometimes the legal team doesn't understand that as well. The legal team may not know what's happening in the fulfillment side. The legal team may see the application side, but not the actual boxes that are going out the door. So a good thing to talk to your, talk when you set up your policies, is make sure you understand your deployment model. So are we software as a service? Are we um, a classic CD-ROM that's going out the door, or DVD? Are we embedded in a device? What are, whatever we may be. And make sure your policy respects that. If you are a company who ships an appliance, you need to be very aware of the general public license. You need to be very aware of where, where your Linux distribution came from. And you may look and say, well, what is our policy for Linux and our Linux distribution? And that may be a separate policy than for your applications. And I've seen this, I've seen this by people as well, is where organizations who start shipping their first Linux appliance, and the, the legal team says, oh, our policy is GPL is OK. Well, that confuses the developers. The, the policy really is, is GPL is OK for our Linux tier because we're going to put it out the door. We, we know we're going to do that. And so we're not going to shy away from using Linux and, and, and being an open source company. But when it comes to our applications, we may want to keep them proprietary and closed. Well, they just got confused because they were told GPL was OK. So start slow, explain the reasons, have different policies for different locations. Make sure your engineers understand what those policies are and why there's a difference between the low end and the high end, say, the low level and the high end. Um, and then do require disclosures of components explicitly linked to or called from your component. So maybe you won't disclose LS or re require a request for LS or CAT. They're just so level, they're low level, they're on your box. You do need to comply with them, but you probably don't need your developers to request them. But if they're explicitly going out and calling um, some command line tool that's required for your product to run, that's probably something you should be aware of and make sure it reflects your policy. Are they linking to it correctly? Are they calling it correctly? Are you keeping up with security patches for it, et cetera, et cetera? Perhaps are you, are you donating money to that component? 
um, to help help improve improve quality there. These are all things that that, that um, can help you start slow, but make sure you're not missing out the missing out on the important things. The other thing here is be aware of what I call hot button issues. BusyBox, the Linux kernel, certain commercial databases. Uh, these are all things that there's people out in the community looking for. People want to make sure that you're doing the right thing around licensing. There's sales organizations making sure that you're paying the right money for your, your database, etc. Make sure that, that you deal with those first. Those are the things that are probably going to be large architectural pieces. They're going to perhaps be the hardest thing to, to change out if you find that there's a problem. And there may be people on the outside um, checking out up on you. So make sure your story is, is correct and your, your compliance with those is, is top notch before you start looking at things that um, you're giving away for free anyway and you're probably not doing any modifications and, um, as delivered to you is just a simple pass through. Another thing here is what we call fighting the last battle. I think we, we see a case in the, in the news this week with, with OpenSSL and Heartbleed. I know right now there's certain organizations who are going out here saying you can no longer use OpenSSL for now and forever. Okay? Uh, we've seen this in the past with things like BusyBox. Because somebody read an article about license enforcement, they put it on their list of something that's just not allowed to be used because they're worried about it. Vulnerabilities or enforcement or just whatever reason, somehow something got added to your policy because of some, some event. And so, for example, right now, I know that some organizations have put open a cell on their blacklist. And what, what now happens is developers, they want to use open as a cell. You know, there's, there's a reason why Heartbleed was such a big deal. It's because everybody's using open as a cell. You know, obviously, there needs to be some more code reviews. There needs to be some fixes and patches and tests and maybe, maybe not an implicit distrust in that software component. But Overnight, we're probably not going to change from it being not allowed ever again, but I do see organizations doing that. So what's going to happen to these developers is they say, well, I've been using OpenSSL for 10 years, 15 years. I, uh, uh, I know how to use it. Our products are already using it. Well, legal just told me OpenSSL is not allowed to be used, or whatever the other component is, not allowed to be used. Well, what happens? They go out, and they pick a new component that's simply a fork of OpenSSL, maybe with a different name. Or maybe it's just a facade to OpenSSL. It's, it's the FUBAR encryption library. And if you look inside of it, it's just a simple a wrapper around OpenSSL. So the component that got requested does not have the name OpenSSL in it at all. But the functionality, the crypto functionality that's being provided is OpenSSL. That's one thing that we see developers do when they're forbidden to use certain libraries. Um, or or they, pick a, a, they pick a work alike, some encryption library, that nobody else in the world is using, that doesn't have any IP or security reviews, and in some ways you end up with a, a worse situation. You, you, you're fighting the last battle. You said OpenSSL has cost us a lot of problems. We're never going to use it again. We're not going to trust it again. And you push yourself perhaps into a creaky corner of the Internet or a creaky corner of the, open, of the open source world. So popular components sometimes, because of the, the, the the PR around them, or the visibility, you know, they, it, makes, it makes the national news when there's a lawsuit, or it makes the national news when there's a, a vulnerability, that sometimes people's policies end up having, uh, being affected by these one-off events far longer than they should be. So things get on the blacklist, and they sometimes are on the blacklist forever or for years. And the original concern is long gone, and people don't even know in some ways why that, that component's on the blacklist. It's been lost to the midst of time but you now are forbidden from using it. So if you are going to use a component blacklist, um, use it sparingly. You know, there, there's reason, you know, it's, it is important to have a blacklist. It's important for people to understand why they can't use certain components. But revise these lists periodically. So three months goes by. You should look and say, do we still have concern about this library? Have they gotten their act together? Has there been a, a, a clean version pushed out in the meantime? Maybe there was a license change. We see this all the time where somebody says, you can't use this particular PDF library because we don't like its license. Well, its license has changed five years ago, but that component is still on the blacklist because when the blacklist was produced, the component blacklist was based on the license that that, that component had five years ago, not its current license. And that's the same thing with whitelists as well. Just because something was good before doesn't mean it's always good. Revise your blacklist and whitelist periodically, especially for large infrastructure pieces. 
and as I always say, use it as a scalpel, not a hammer. You might want to forbid certain versions of OpenSSL. You might want to forbid certain versions of certain PDF libraries because of licensing, but others others should be allowed. Again, every company sets up their own policies, and it's up to you to do it. But make sure that you're make sure that you don't cause your developers to route around quality components just because of something that happened a long time ago. So with that, I believe we have a couple minutes here for questions and answers. And let me see if I can move over uh, to the uh, Q&A section here. Give me a second. We have one question here that says, how do you revise policies? And it, it, in some ways, it, it's the same way you created the policies in the first place. It, it's a good time to get your legal team together with your engineering teams. Uh, if you have an architecture team as well, it's good to talk about it at that time. So legal, you know, very often this is a place of an open source review board or just a, a, a lunchtime brown bag every, once a quarter or once a year or once every six months where legal can explain why they're setting up policies. Architecture can explain why certain technologies have to be used. So if we're going to ship a Linux appliance, we need to have Linux. We may need to have BusyBox. Uh, engineering teams can talk about training for their teams and what's what's allowed, you know, what what are what, what's bubbling down to the line level developer about the policies that are coming in place. So um, good good to get those teams together. I see a lot of companies where legal creates policies and engineering ignores policies because they never talked and the policies policies may be great legal policies but don't make sense operationally. And we see a lot of times when engineering ignores good policies because they don't understand the original intent. So the more communication, you know, the more pizza, the more whatever it is that you that you can get to get legal teams, engineering teams, and architecture teams to talk, the better your policies are going to be and the more engagement you're going to get from your developers. Anything else? That was the only. Oh, one more question here. It says, um, "How do you motivate engineering groups to follow policy?" Uh, we've never had to do this before, and we don't have time for this, etc. This, this is this is definitely a very big pushback. Uh, what one of the things that I, that I see helps is when you talk to engineering teams and you talk about why we're doing this. Well, if you just say we don't, so we don't get sued, in some ways that's true, but that's not very, it doesn't motivate people. Uh, one thing that I see has, has often helped is talk about the engagement with the open source world. We want to use open source. We want to engage with open source. We want to be able to create our own open source, but we need to be, we need to be good citizens. We need to show that we respect open source. We give credit where credit's due. If the open source teams tell us a simple list of things we can do and we can't do, shame on us if we don't follow their simple list. They were good enough to give this to us for free with, with a simple list of obligations. We need to respect that. Um, part of this, too, is to get you have to get um, uh, management engagement. If it's just up to developers to say, oh, I'm going to follow this or not follow this, well, it always gets routed around. Um, I, I often call this shipitis, meaning we need to ship our product, and anything that keeps us from shipping our product doesn't get done. And you see that affecting quality, performance, footprint, all those things sometimes get thrown out the door if you have to make your deadline. IP policy is one of those things as well, if you don't make it a, a requirement. I've seen a lot of organizations say the, the project manager or the VP of engineering is required to sign off on every um, IP disclosure before release. That's a good way of making sure it gets done. If it's just up to engineers to follow policy, it does not get done. If you get management um, engagement and you make it a requirement, somebody's MBO, somebody's requir requirement to physically sign off on a piece of paper saying, um, this is all the open source and commercial code we're using, you, you see it get done. Um, and part of it is you have to build the time in. Just like you're building time in for QA, you need to build the time in for, for following open source obligations. It gets easier. Your first time through is going to take a while. It's, I, I, it's detective work. There's a lot of technical dust that's been built up there because for the last 15 years, people have not been basically respecting the open source world. They haven't been respecting the licenses. 
and they're shipping things that they shouldn't be shipping. They're not giving credit to what credit's due. And part of it is digging through that technical debt. Part of this, another way, good way, is to say for all new stuff going forward, we need to respect the licenses. You need to make a res you need to make a request. Typical developer is not going to ask for too many components over the course of the year. Make sure that people understand um, the expectations. Make sure that there is education, and and make sure that there's maybe some some consequences for not following the rules. You know, just as if I copied code from my old company and put it in, I'm going to get in trouble. If I copy code from the outside world and I put it in, I ship it without following policies and procedures. Somebody should talk to me. Somebody should explain what the problem was there and the effect to the company, and make sure that this doesn't happen again. I mean, obviously, start start easy, start slow. But after a while, if teams are just not respecting, <coughs> you know, the legal policies, you should have as a legal team the, the, the kind of the the ability to come in and say, hey, guys, this is not right. You know, this is this is not an optional thing. This is something we need to do. You know, just like we pay our taxes, just like we don't pour toxic waste in the ground, just like we don't, um, you know, we pay our vendors. We respect the open source community. It's, it's not, you know, it's not just the right thing to do. It's, it's the required thing. Um, next question here is, do you find blacklist policies on balance are based on commercial advantage or a lack of, of the product? Let's see. Um, Phil, so, so can you give me a little, um, uh, maybe a little bit of re refinement on that question? So do you mean that are blacklist policies based on um, don't use this so we're, 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 we're good from a commercial perspective? or based on the quality of the library. Um, for me, typically, I'll, I'll take a stab at it until you can follow up if, uh, if, uh, if this doesn't answer your questions. But usually when I see blacklist policies come out around a couple reasons. One is around licensing. So if there's a certain component that has its, what's called strong licensing that is just not allowed, that's going to be something that's put on the blacklist. We, we also see very common libraries that have horrible security holes get put on the blacklist. So um, Zlib, for example, great open source library. It is the most common open source library you're going to see. Extremely high quality, great, great community, great developers there. But in the past, they had some, some versions that had um, known security vulnerabilities. They were fixed very quickly. They were you know, made very easy to take the new, new replacements. But we still see old copies of the, basically the, the broken versions of Zlib floating around still being requested. That's a perfect place for a, a blacklist. If you're going to use Zlib 1.1.2 or Zlib 1.2.2, that's on the blacklist. Go use something. Go use the newer version. But we're, we're going we're gonna to reject the usage of that. That, that seems like that, that answered those, those things. We, we do also see people put blacklists for competitors' code or competitors' open source projects. Sometimes there's some concerns about patents and, and the, the licenses that are coming in. And if there is a, a large competitor who, who is supporting an open source library, there is sometimes some concern about if it's under a certain license or if it's from a certain vendor, that that may just be too close to home, that you don't want to tie your company and their company together. And even if something has a great license, if something has a great user community, we do see cases where a blacklist is used to just help developers sometimes understand the business needs of the company that may be separate from the, say, the license needs of the company. So it's another place I'll see, I'll see blacklists. And then also sometimes countries of origin. Um, recently saw a case where there was a very high quality JavaScript component, went to the, went to the page, beautiful, it just looked, you know, looked like great artwork, great, um, uh, great text. Perfect, perfect software component, JavaScript component. Everybody wanted to use it, but it turns out it was coming from a university in Iran. And there are many companies who just couldn't use code and have any interaction um, with their product with, with code from an Iranian um, uh, software product. And that ended up being on the blacklist, not because of licensing, but because of country of origin and export control and, and, and interaction rules that the company had. And it was, it was a surprise for people because it just looked, you know, it looked like straight, something straight out of, um, you know, the, the best Silicon Valley uh, hip uh, uh, dot com. And it was just some university student in Iran. And, you know, unfortunately, they weren't able to use it because of their internal policy. Another good reason to have a policy, though, make it clear to developers 
um, information you learn over time that may not be apparent from just reading the web page. Okay. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. If anybody wants to get one last question in before we wrap it up today. I don't see. So with that, I will uh, I will thank everyone here for uh, today joining us today. If you have any feedback or follow up, please uh, please let me know. Uh, for more information about Palomita, we're reachable obviously at palomita.com. Uh, if you have any feedback for me, I always appreciate uh, follow up and feedback on these presentations. Just send send, send something to Jeff at Palomita. And lastly, if you want to follow us on Twitter, we are at, uh, at twitter.com, Palomita underscore Inc. So thank you again for joining us today, and thanks for these great questions and the feedback, um, as always. And we will be placing this presentation up on the, uh, up on the website. Um, I may re-record it if, uh, if the construction noise in the background is too loud. I do apologize for that. Uh, they're putting up a building next door, and it's uh, making a little bit too much noise in the conference room here. So thank you all again, and uh, we will talk to you next month in the next Palomino webinar series.